Sutra, World Honored One. Also, Ananda and those like him have become enlightened. They have not yet cast out their hobbies and outflows. Commentary, World Honored One. Also, Ananda and those like him have become enlightened. They have not yet cast out their hobbies and outflows. Also, they have understood the principle of becoming enlightened. Their hobbies go back many lives, many eons. And where do outflows come from? They come from habits. Habits aren't created in a day. They are learned from time without beginning, through life after life, in time after time, and from these learned habits come all kinds of outflows. What is meant by outflows? Outflows are afflictions. The afflictions and hobbies of Ananda and those like him have not been completely done away with. They are called the remaining hobbies, the ones left over from former lives. They are more or less like karma. The Buddha had a disciple called Pilinda Vatsa. One day he wanted to cross a river and since he had been certified as having attained the fruition of a hardship, he had a certain powers. Rivers have spirits and the spirits of this particular river was female. When Pilan Davatsa got to the bank of the river, he called out, Little servant, stop the flow. One who is an Ahata has the spiritual power to part the waters when he crosses a river, but the one who stops the flow of the river must be the river spirit. That is why Pilan Davatsa called out, Little servant, stop the flow. The first time he did that, the river spirit was annoyed but did not dare say anything because Pilinda Vatsa was in her heart. But after he addressed her as a little servant a number of times, the river spirit finally went to the Buddha to state her case. When your disciple Pilinda Vatsa wants to cross the river, he always addresses me as little servant, she complained, and I'm outraged. Buddha, you should teach your disciples not to be so ill-mannered. How can he call me a name like that and command me the way he does? So the Buddha called for Pilinda Vatsa, apologized to the river spirit, he said, and don't talk that way anymore. So what do you suppose Pilinda Vatsa did? He said, little servant, don't hold a grudge. The whole reason that she had become upset was that he had called her little servant in the first place. Of course, the river spirit was furious. See, she cried, your disciple calls me that right in front of you. Shakyamuni Buddha said, do you know why he calls you little servant? In 500 former lives, you were his servant. You worked for him for so long that... When he sees you, he reverts to his former habits and that name just slips off his tongue. He hasn't been able to change that habit from the past. After the Buddha explained to the river spirit, she realized it was a question of cause and effect and there was nothing more to say. The situation was resolved. That is an example of not having cast out their habits and outflows. Sutra, we in the assembly have reached the level of no outflows, yet although we have no outflows, we still have doubts about the drama we have now heard the first come one speak. Commentary, Purna said, we in the assembly, the multitude of sages, have reached the level of no outflows. We have received the reward of the spiritual power of having extinguished all outflows. Yet, although we have no outflows, we still have doubts about the drama we have now heard the first come one speak. We still think of doubts. We still don't understand. Now, if those who had attained the fourth version with the extinction of outflows didn't understand, how much the less would Ananda have understood since he had only been certified as having attained the first fruition. Although he had attained that level of enlightenment, I believe 
just wasn't clear about the meaning of the Buddha had just expressed. Sutra won't honor one if all the sense organs, sense objects, skandhas, places, and realms in all the world are the treasury of the first come one. Originally pure, why do all conditioned appearances such as the mountains, the rivers, and the great earth suddenly arise? Commentary Pana has doubts about the doctrines the Buddha has been explaining. He doesn't believe them, won't or not one. If all the sense organs, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, sense objects, forms, sounds, smells, tastes, of touches, and dramas, skanda, form, feeling, thought, activity, and consciousnesses, if all these dramas in all the world are the treasury of the first come one, why do all conditioned appearances such as the mountains, the rivers, and the great earth suddenly arise? If they arise from the bright substance and pure nature of the everlasting true mind and are originally pure, then why does there suddenly arise in the purity of the treasury of the first come on so many things which are all conditioned appearances that suddenly arise? Once finished, they begin again. Done once more, they start over. and they arise once more. When do they ever stop? Never. What's the principle in it? This is the doubt that Puna asks the world honored one about. Sutra. Moreover, the first common said that earth, water, fire, and wind are by nature perfectly fused, are all perceived in the Dharma realm, and are all tranquil and are everlasting. Commentary. This is Puna Maitreyamni Putra's second doubt. What is the principle here? He asked. Sutra. World honored one, if the nature of earth is pervasive, how can it contain water? If the nature of water is pervasive, then fire does not arise. Further, how do you explain that the natures of fire and water can each pervade empty space? Without displacing one another, hold on at one. The nature of earth is solid, the nature of emptiness is penetrating. How can they both pervade the Dharma realm? I don't know where this doctrine is leading. Commentary Purna probably was smarter than Ananda. Ananda had, hadn't even thought of such questions as this. So now Purna, for his part, has some doubts and asked about these principles. He says, Won't or not one, if the nature of earth is pervasive, how can it contain water? Earth overcomes water. Where there is dry land, there is no water. If the nature of earth pervades the Dharma realm, how can there be water there too? Earth and water are not compatible. If the nature of water is pervasive, then fire does not arise. Water overcomes fire. Where there is water, there is no fire. Water puts fire out. If the nature of water were to pervade the Dharma realm, fire would certainly disappear. This is the same line of argument the Buddha used earlier with Ananda when he said that if there is light, there can't be darkness, and if there is darkness, there can't be light. Now the Buddha's disciple uses the same pattern of questioning on the Buddha. Water and fire don't mix, Purna points out. This is a fixed principle. Further, how do you explain that the natures of fire and water can each pervade empty space without displacing one another? How do you come to understand that both the fire and water pervade the drama realm? I could believe that one or the other was all pervasive, but if two incompatible things are both all pervasive, then which one is go going to win out? How do you know they can both be all pervasive and not oppose one another, not harm one another or destroy one another? World or not one, the nature of earth is solid, the nature of emptiness is penetrating, how can they both pervade the drama realm? Purna imagines that by now he probably has thoroughly confused the Buddha. 
so he calls out to him, warned or not one, or maybe he was afraid that the Buddha was asleep. Earth is a solid object, he reasons. Emptiness is penetrating the cures. There isn't anything there at all. So if there is earth, there is no emptiness. If there is emptiness, there is no earth. How can you say both of these natures are all pervasive? I don't know where this doctrine is leading. Buddha, your explanation of Dharma has managed to confuse me now. I can't tell what you're getting at. Where is this principle headed? What is aim? I don't understand. Sutra, I only hope the first come one will compassionately explain in order to rend the clouds of confusion in me and among the great assembly. After saying this, he made a few prostration and respectfully and expectantly awaited the first commons and the past compassionate instruction. Commentary in stating these principles, Pona was certainly not trying to debate with the Buddha. He truly had such doubts. Water and fire are not brothers. They can't dwell, dwell in the same household. Earth and emptiness are not compatible either. These questions made him nervous. How can they all believe the Dharma realm? He wondered, and on impulse, heedless of everything, he began to question the Buddha in his heart. He even forgot about propriety. So, in conclusion, he says, I only hope the first government will compassionately explain in order to rend the clouds of confusion in me and among the good assembly. Won't honored one, please let flow forth your heart of great compassion and explain this matter for us. My failure to understand these doctrines is like a bank of clouds covering me. Not only do I have these doubts, the members of the great assembly do also. After saying this, he probably realized that he had been impertinent and over exuberant, so he made a few a phone frustration and respectfully and expectantly awaited the first commons and the past com compassionate instruction. He quickly knelt and bowed to properly make his request of the Buddha with reverence. He waited as if excessively thirsty for the first commons to nourish him with the water of Dharma. Sutra, the world honored one, then told Purna and all the Ahas in the assembly who had distinguished their outflows and had reached the level of no study. Today, the first common will explain in depth the true supreme meaning within the supreme meaning in order to cause all of you in the assembly who are faced nature, sound hearers, and those Ahas who have not realized the two kinds of emptiness but are dedicated to the superior vehicle as well as the others to obtain the place of still extinction. The one vehicle, the true Aranya, the proper place of cultivation. Listen attentively and I will explain it for you. Purna and the others, revering the Buddha's expression of Dharma, listened silently. Commentary, the warned honored one then told Pona and all the Mahas in the assembly who had extinguished their outflows and had reached the level of no study. Those who had been certified as having attained the fourth fruition of Ahaship. Today, the first common will was explain in depth the true supreme meaning within the supreme meaning. Here, the Buddha is referring to himself when he says, the first come one, true supreme meaning within the supreme meaning, refers to the most superior miraculous doctrine. He explains it in order to cause all of you in the assembly who are fixed nature sound hearers, that is, people who gain a little and are satisfied. They hang around in emptiness and stop searching. I am at a place where there isn't anything at all. It's not bad, they think and become content. They gain a little and that's enough. That's why the Buddha calls them the first natural sound hearer. 
their hearts still rightly seize the unrefilled sprouts. In order to scold them out of their complacency, they don't have the impetus to go on. Having been satisfied as having attained the first or second fruition, they don't seek to progress. They indulge in passivity. It's fine here, they decide. The Buddha will also explain for those of us who have not realized the two kinds of emptiness but are dedicated to the superior vehicle. This refers to a house who have not yet understood the emptiness of people and the emptiness of dramas, but who will have turned from the small toward the great, and he will speak as well for all the others in the great assembly. Shakyamuni Buddha is prepared to express the true superior meaning within the superior meaning. The wonderful within the wonderful to cause their hearts to obtain no outflows, to obtain the level of no study. To have no outflows means to have forgot, uh, to have gotten rid of all one's individual habits and faults, to have no afflictions, to have no fundamental ignorance. So if one destroys fundamental ignorance, afflictions also disappear. Since afflictions and ignorance are invisible, we don't think of them as being plentiful, but in fact, if they took form, they would fill up empty space throughout the Dharma realm. Now the Buddha wants to cause all living beings, all the Ahas, to obtain the place of still extinction, the one vehicle, the true Aranya, the proper place of cultivation. The one vehicle is the final meaning of the middle way. The principle of the actual appearance, it is the great white ops card discussed in the Dharma Flower Sutra. That Sutra says that there was a large house in which a great elder lived with his children. One day when the elder was gone briefly, the children were playing in the house when suddenly it caught on fire. When the elder returned and saw the children in the burning house of the years of the danger, he said to them, Come to the door quickly. Outside I have sheep carts and deer carts and ox carts for you to play with. When the children heard that there were carts and things to play with, they came running out. The house burned to the ground, but the children did not perish. Once the children got out of the house, they demanded the carts from the elder. He gave them instead a great white ox cart magnificent beyond any of their expectations. The sheep carts and deer carts represent the two vehicles. The ox carts represent the Bodhisattva vehicle. The great white ox cart represents the one Buddha vehicle. It can transport all living beings across the current of afflictions from the shore of birth and death to the other shore of Nirvana. An Aranya is a Bodhimanda, a quiet place for cultivation. Why is the Aranya described as true? Are there also false Aranyas? A true Aranya is a place where there is no chaos. No one talks. A lot of people dwell together, but it's as if there weren't anyone there at all. Not even the sound of a mosquito's breathing can be heard. If you want to cultivate the way, you should learn not to talk so much. When there is too much talking, other people cannot reach Samadhi. When it's time to talk, you should talk. But some disciples talk when it's not time to talk, and when it is time to talk, they don't. Would you say they are obedient or disobedient? An obedient disciple talks when it is time to talk, and when it is not time to talk, he closes his mouth. If you are a good student, you are a good Buddhist disciple. If you are a good Buddhist disciple, in the future you will become a good Buddha. Are there Buddhas who are not good? Of course not. All Buddhas are good, but if you are not good, you cannot become a Buddha. You first have to be good in order to in order for it to count. In a true Aranya, people keep a tight schedule. Listen attentively and I will explain it for you. 
This is not simply the Buddha telling Pona and Ananda to listen carefully. Now I am explaining the sutra and it is me telling you to listen carefully. Pona and the others, revering the Buddha's expression of drama, listened silently. Revering means that they listened with great respect to the Buddha speaking drama. They listened with very great regard for him. They listened silently. Not only do I tell you not to talk, Pana and Ananda were also silent. They closed their mouths.